once upon a time in China, back during the Qing dynasty, when Pu Sung Ling was writing his monumental Strange Stories from a Chinese Studio, four weary merchants arrived at a roadside inn on a chilly October evening. The men were tired and hungry and wanted food and a place to sleep. But alas, there was no room at the inn. The men argued and gesticulated until the old innkeeper gave in and told them he might have a place for them to sleep if they weren't too particular. They weren't. Now recently the old landlord's daughter-in-law had passed away and her corpse had been placed in an old barn until her husband could buy a coffin. She lay on her bier, clad in a traditional paper robe behind a curtain at the rear of the chamber. After a hearty meal of noodles, steamed rice, and warm sweet wine, the four merchants returned to the barn where sleeping couches had been set out for them and a lantern left on a table by the front door. The exhausted men fell upon the couches and were soon fast asleep, all except for one. In spite of being dead tired, this man, whose name was Tan, had trouble drifting off. He was apprehensive and found himself staring at the shadows cast by the flickering lantern and listening to the sounds of the night. And because he was awake, he heard the sound of rustling paper and the creaking of the beer, and turning his head, he saw the corpse of the dead woman step from behind the curtain at the end of the room. His heart nearly stopped when he caught sight of the woman's face, which was chalky white as if drained of blood, but which seemed to glow with a strange greenish aura. Tan watched her move, glide in a stealthy manner towards the couch of the sleeping man closest to her, where she stopped and, bending over, blew on the unconscious man's face. After a few minutes, the dead woman left the first man and moved to the next and blew on his face, then moved to the third man. While the corpse's attention was diverted, Tan managed to pull the covers up over his face, and when he heard the rustling paper which heralded the dead woman's approach, he held his breath. He held his breath and prayed. The corpse bent over Tan and blew a stream of cold, frigidly cold and disgustingly charnel breath onto the spot where his face was covered by the thin, oh too thin blanket. Tan had to fight the urge to gag and struggled to hold his breath and remain still until he was on the verge of passing out. After an eternity, which in reality was only a minute or two, Tan again heard the rustling of the dead woman's paper robes. Was she actually leaving him? He then heard the swish of the curtains and the creaking of the beer. Had she gone back to her resting place? Slowly, oh so slowly, Tan lowered his blanket, which seemed to be wet with, with, with a greasy, frost-like muck. A greasy, frost-like muck. Tan got up as quietly as he could and tiptoed over to the nearest couch. Gently, he reached down and touched the sleeping man and then recoiled in horror. His friend was obviously dead. The sound of rustling paper warned Tan of the woman's return and he barely managed to hide beneath the covers as the dead woman stepped out from behind the drapes. Once again, 
the corpse stalked over to where Tan pretended to sleep, and once more she hissed a cold, fetid stream of death onto the blanket covering his face. Tan held his breath until he thought he could hold it no more. But finally, the woman returned to her trestle. Tan knew he had to flee. Moving as quietly as possible, he was attempting to retrieve his clothes when he heard the rustling paper, the creaking beer, and the sound of the curtains being pulled aside. The dead woman stood glaring at him. Then, shrieking like a banshee, attacked, arms outstretched, each of her fingers ending in a red-painted nail as long and as sharp as a dagger. Tan ran out into the darkness, and now that he no longer needed to keep quiet, he bellowed at the top of his lungs, screaming for help, while the dead woman glided after him, right on his heels. Arriving at the inn, Tan pounded frantically for admission, but he raised such a clamor the people inside refused to open the door. Then, feeling a blast of fetid and frigidly cold air on the back of his neck, Tan bolted, narrowly dodging the she-creature as she swooped down on him, clawed hands raised. Across from the inn stood a Buddhist temple, and Tan, still screaming for help, understandable but not wise when trying to run, ran to the temple door where he pounded and pleaded to be let in. But Tan only succeeded in frightening the monks, who thought he was a robber and wouldn't open up. And then she was there, and Tan had no refuge, but ducked behind a nearby willow tree. What followed was a deadly game of cat and mouse, or hide and seek, as Tan tried to hide behind the too thin willow, too thin. The corpse would lunge at him, and he would dodge her over and over and over and over, feigning, dodging, and ducking until his body was covered in sweat and his breath came in gasps. And then suddenly the woman stopped dead and stood stock still and pounced. Tan passed out passed out from a combination of exhaustion and sheer terror. And at first, when he regained consciousness, he wondered if he too was dead. The corpse loomed over him, dead again and reduced to little better than a dried out mummy, her claw-like nails stuck into the bark of the willow, holding her, holding it, upright. The monks had emerged from the temple at first light, and upon finding the dazed man and the dead woman, immediately sent for the magistrate, who ordered the remains of the corpse burned. Tan quickly recovered, but went to the magistrate in tears. Four of us left our village together, but if only I return, the people will think I have done away with the others murdered them for their money, for their cash. What shall I do? And so the magistrate gave Tan a certificate testifying as to Tan's innocence and explaining that the murdered men had fallen victim to a resuscitated corpse. A resuscitated corpse. If Tan had shown you such a document, would you believe it? Would you really? During the Qing dynasty, a man named Wang was out taking his morning constitutional 
when he noticed a pretty young woman of 18 struggling with a heavy bundle. Being a gentleman, Wang inquired if he could be of assistance, and the young woman burst into tears. Wang gently asked as to the source of her distress, and she told him that her own parents had sold her as a concubine to a rich man whose jealous wife beat and abused her to the point she felt she had no choice but to run away. And now, now she had nowhere to go. Now, Wang was a kind man and, concerned for the young woman's welfare, invited her to stay at his home, which was nearby. The young woman readily assented, but warned Wang to keep her presence a secret for his own safety. Wang's house was a sprawling affair with a large library enclosed by a high wall, so he took her there for concealment, and she stayed there, hidden, for several days, until Wang broke down and told his wife of their strange guest. Wang's wife urged her husband to send the young woman away. She was afraid she might have run away from some rich and powerful family and that Wang might find himself in considerable trouble. <laughs> but he just laughed at her concerns and the young woman remained secluded in the library. A few days later, Wang was walking through the marketplace when he was accosted by a Taoist priest who began sniffing him and then followed his extraordinary behavior by asking Wang if he had recently encountered any strangers. When Wang said that he had met no one, the priest said, Then why are you bewitched? When Wang laughed in his face, the priest became angry and said, Fool! Don't you know you're near death? Wang walked away with a smirk, figuring the priest was merely trying to sell him a lucky charm against demons. Still, he had encountered a stranger recently, the young woman. He decided to question her to see what further information he could learn as to her background and situation, in case something was truly amiss. But when Wang attempted to enter the library, he was unable to open the outer door, which forced him into the undignified extremity of having to climb the outer wall. Once inside, he found the inner door to the library tightly locked as well. Greatly alarmed, Wang refrained from knocking on the door, but moved to a nearby window where the young woman had her makeshift bedroom. And looking in, he froze. Within, a demon with a greenish face and body and a mouth full of black jagged fangs was hand-painting, was touching up and repairing a human skin. As Wang watched in horror, the demon applied a final stroke, then picked up the skin and shook it out like a suit of clothes, and then put the skin on. It was the young woman! Wang crept away before she noticed him and went in search of the priest. Finding him in a field outside the city, he threw himself on his knees and demanded the priest save him, abjectly apologizing for having failed to believe him. The priest disengaged himself and contemplated the passionate request. Finally, he said, This creature must be in great distress if it has chosen to hide by taking on human form. I cannot take any action that would bring harm to it, as it too is a living creature. 
As you might imagine, Wang was scarcely satisfied with such an answer and continued to cry and prostrate himself upon the ground. Eventually, the priest took pity on him and gave Wang a fly whisk. Wang looked at it with incredulous amazement. And what am I to do with this? he sputtered. Place it above your bedroom door. It will protect you. Wang was rather dubious, but he accepted the fly whisk and agreed to meet the priest at the temple the next day. Returning home, he hung the fly whisk above his bedroom door and then hid inside where he cowered in fear. After a while, he heard the sound of approaching footsteps, and too afraid to move, Wang got his wife to look out. The girl stood just outside the door, glaring up at the fly whisk, grinding her teeth in anger. Then she stalked away. But before Wang could breathe a sigh of relief, she was back screaming, So, Sir Priest, you think you can defeat me? I claim this man. He is mine, mine. And with that, she tore down the fly whisk, shredding it into tiny pieces with her claw-like hands, before pushing open the door and racing into the room to confront Wang, ripping open his chest with talon-like fingers and tearing out his still-beating heart before sauntering away with it. The servants came running, alerted by the wife's screams, and were confronted by a scene dripping with gore. Too frightened to move, they remained there, immersed in the bloody mess, until one of them finally went to fetch Wang's brother, who in turn went to look for the priest. When the Taoist learned of Wang's murder, he flew into a rage. And to think, I showed compassion to this demon. He then accompanied the brother to Wang's house, where he surveyed the mutilated corpse. Sniffing the air, the priest said, Fortunately, the demon is not far off, and he indicated some apartments on the southern end of Wang's compound. Who lives there? the priest inquired. Those are my apartments, Wang's brother answered. Have you met with any strangers recently? Strangers? No. None at all? Well, just the old woman. Ah, the old woman. Oh, just an old woman begging for charity. My wife put her to work, scrubbing floors. Then let us examine this drudge and find out what she might tell us. As he walked towards the apartments, the priest drew a wooden sword and in a penetrating voice called out, Base-born fiend, give me back my fly whisk. The old woman appeared in the yard and made for the nearest exit with supernatural speed, but the priest blocked her way and knocked her to the ground, her human skin splitting and falling away from her body to reveal a hideous greenish demon which sprawled, growling and grunting before them. The priest raised the wooden sword above his shorn head and whacked the demon's head clean off. The demon's body then began to twist and writhe and turned into a column of thick, acrid, greasy black smoke. The priest took a small gourd from his robes and held it towards the smoke, which was sucked into the vessel, which the priest stoppered with a cork before returning it to his robes. The priest then gathered up the skin the demon had used as a disguise. It was complete, 
with eyes, ears, nose, hands, feet. Carefully, he rolled it up and tucked it under his arm. But what of my brother? Can you bring him back to life? The priest shook his head. No, but I have saved him from the demon in the afterlife. And then he slowly walked away. Perhaps he smirked. The moral of the story? Evil can sometimes appear very attractive. Beware. If this is your first visit to my channel, please consider subscribing. My name is Warren, and I write and tell original ghost stories and original horror stories featuring such cryptids as the night floaters, werewolves, and the black-eyed children. So again, please consider subscribing. Till midnight, cheers! Text used today, courtesy of Project Gutenberg. Pictures, courtesy of Pix Here, that's P-X Here, while the music was the phantasmic ghost story. Ghost story by that patron of YouTube, the wonderful Kevin McLeod.